Good morning and welcome to your church service here at New Light Church in Deland, Florida. Uh, we're glad that you're here, but we're also glad that you are watching us from really all over our country, and we thank you. The announcements are today is communion, first Sunday of every month, so if you would like to get a piece of bread and maybe some juice so that we can all celebrate together. Uh, also, we have uh, made it through another month. We were running uh, several hundred dollars short, and one of our members made up for that difference, and we thank them in reminding you that we uh, need your stewardship. Also, if you live locally, we invite you to our live service here and uh, would have you worship with us in person. Pam, our Minister of Music, is at a family reunion today in Nashville, Tennessee, so we uh, wish her well and look forward to her uh, immediate return uh, to be with us. So it's just uh, Fawn and Alan, so let us praise let us praise the Lord in music. Good morning. Please join us for a patriotic medley this morning. And the words should be on the screen and in your bulletin on the insert. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red clear the bombs bursting in air it proved through the night that our flag was still to 692 Battle Hymn of the Republic and those online your lyrics should be online oh your lyrics aren't online are you not today just sing along you know the words we'll do verses 1 2 and 4 mine eyes have seen the 
glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. righteous sentence by the dim and flaming lamps. His day is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. In the beauty Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his being that transfigures you and me as he died to make man holy let us live to make him free how God is marching Good morning, our most gracious Heavenly Father. On this day, we celebrate the birthday of our country, a time that we were able to gain freedom from a worldly king and give our oaths and our allegiance to a heavenly king, a time that we could be freed from oppression a time that we would have the freedom to think. And today, because of those who sacrificed their lives, we can be free. And because Jesus died on the cross, we can be free from sin, free from a spiritual death. And for this, O oh Lord, we praise your name and give you thanks. Thank you for giving us free choice. This day we do pray for our country through all of the disunity that we experience and honestly, O oh Lord, the dysfunction. It would seem that the farther away from you that we move, the closer to evil we become. We always lift up those who protect us, the police, the fire, the EMTs, and of course our young men and women who guard us through the military. And on this very special day, we ask that we pray that prayer that your son Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Hear our prayer, God above, as we come to you and seek your patient love. Hear our hearts, 
Hear our minds, hear the echoes of the words we cannot find. So we pray in faith, your will be done. As we long to see your kingdom come, we ask with one voice, we ask with one voice, through Jesus Christ our Lord, through Jesus Christ our Lord. I know you all know our special anthem, so please sing along. God bless the USA. If tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd worked for all my life. And I had to start again with just my family by my side. I thank my God above. To be living here today Cause the flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away And I'm proud to be an American For when at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died Who gave that right to me And I gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today cause there ain't no doubt i love this land god bless the usa from the lakes of minnesota to the hills of tennessee across the plains of texas from sea to shining sea from Detroit down to Houston and New York to LA where well, there's pride in every American heart and it's time we stand and say that I'm proud to be an American where at least I know I'm free and I won't forget the men who died who gave that right to me and I gladly next to you and defend her still today cause there ain't no doubt i love this land god bless the usa if you're able please stand and i'm proud to be an american where at least i know i'm free and i won't forget the men who died who gave that right to me and i gladly stand up next to you and defend her still today cause there ain't no doubt i love this land god bless the usa my microphone all the electronics that we have to use thank you Alan and Fawn and Fawn you can have the rest of the service off <laughs> after you've done uh, double duty Y'all will have to give me a second. I'm adjusting my microphone. Need some help? No. I remember when I started in the ministry, we didn't have microphones and speakers and sound system and electric keyboards. But now we do. title of the sermon is Let Freedom Ring. Our scripture is out of the book of Romans, 
So if you would turn in your Bibles to the sixth chapter of Romans, and because of time we will uh, be looking at the first uh, nine verses, but the uh, sermon in Scripture is up till the 23rd verse, the whole chapter. Let us listen to these verses. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You see, Paul's been preaching that uh, no matter what your sin is, you can be forgiven because you've been forgiven by grace. So people are saying, then what's the use of living a godly life? What's the use of doing right? Because if the, in, in the end we're going to be saved by grace, then we can just live any way we want. God forbid, Paul says. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So Paul is saying, look, when you accepted Christ, when you were baptized, when you became a Christian, when you decided to follow Jesus, the desire, the inclination of wanting to sin died. That's what it means to die, that spiritual life uh, of the carnal life. Know ye not or don't you know? That so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. As Jesus died for our sins, now we also have our sins, uh, make ourselves die in our sins, and our sins are dead. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, that's how he arose from this world, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So as we celebrate the coming of Jesus, as we celebrate his death, burial, and most especially his resurrection, that now that we are new creatures in Christ and we are in this newness of faith and relationship, we should be walking right. Verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, he died for our sin, therefore we should try to live as a uh, sinless uh, life as we can, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man, that is our sin, our carnality, our human nature, that our old man is crucified with him. So as Jesus died for our sins, now our sins, a part of us that is man's nature, dies with Christ. But the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So he's going back ask, uh, answering that question and addressing it. If we're saved by grace, then can't we just live any way we want and fall upon grace to be saved? He said no. And he goes back and repeats. and says, no, we shall not in any way serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Again, not only uh, uh, are we no longer accountable for that, but... Also, we have no desire for that. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So we know that our body becomes the temple of God. And as we walk and talk and as we submit ourselves to the discipline of Christ, that sin, as much as we can, is not going to be a part of our life. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth, no more. We're not going to die forever. We're only going to have one death. Death hath no more dominion over him. That is Jesus and you and I. Let me try to wrap up these uh, nine uh, verses in very short sentences. When we accept Christ as the Son of God, and as the Savior, our nature, that is our depravity, our sin, dies. We have no desire to sin. 
Now, does that mean that the moment that we are converted and baptized and consecrated into uh, the life of Christ, does that mean that we become perfect? Does that mean that we sin no more? Of course not. We still remain in this human nature, in this body. Remember, that was Paul. one of Paul's frustrations, was that he could just not get close enough to God, that he was always reminded that he had this body of a human. As Christ was resurrected, these verses tell us, so will we. So what do we base our theology on? We base our theology on if God told us through Christ that as he was resurrected, we too shall be resurrected. Christ is free from sin, so are we. We are dead to sin. It will have no effect on us. We shall live with Christ. Again, that does not mean that we can just go out and do anything we want. We now are followers of Christ, and we are trying to do what he would do. Let me further minimize these verses and go with just two sentences. As non-believers, we are born once and we die once, which leaves us in the grave. There's no way out of it. But as believers, we're born twice and only die once. So we die a physical human death, but then there is a born again experience and that born again experience gives us an extra life. Our country, our nation, from the very beginning has been put to the test. We hopefully realizing the cost of freedom, that this cost causes and involves thinking, and action, and knowledge, and commitment to a process, a system, an ideal, if you will. Are we as a country perfect? No. Are we as Christians perfect? No. But we continue to practice and push forward for this ideal as you and I, as Christians, push forward to become more like Christ. There is an easier way to govern. There is a more efficient, there is a more effective system, and that system of government lies just 90 miles south of Key West, and that is a dictatorship, a tyranny. But freedom is not about efficiency. It's about choice. And choice involves conflict and confrontation because not all of us think exactly alike. Lady left my church one day when I was uh, active and not retired and she said, uh, Preacher, it's just funny because I agree with everything you say. I said, Lady, I am really worried about you. <laughs> I have, I have some deep concerns that you think that everything I say is right because I've gone back and looked at some of my notes from some of my sermons and I said, did I say that? Why didn't somebody throw something at me? So there's always conflict when we think, just like in Christianity. As we meet together to teach and pray and sing, we're not all thinking the same thoughts. But through God's grace, he will bring us together back into one body. God could have made us with no brain. And I think there might be a few of those walking around. But he could have made us with no brain, no desires. He could have made us with having no will. But he chose to make us free thinkers. And that doesn't mean just to think anything we want. But what free thinker here means that when we choose him, we have freely selected him under no duress. Nobody forced me to become a Christian. Nobody forced me to accept Christ. That that was my decision 
and my decision only. We all know the, the well-used verse, John 3.16, For whosoever believeth upon him shall not perish. So there is that select group, those who believe on him. Christian freedom, much like our republic, does not come automatically, nor does it come easily. The ingredients for the concrete, for the mortar of our house of faith is blood, sweat, and tears. The consequence for not having these ingredients, that is, our acts of faith, will make our house crumble and will put us into bondage. If our lives are regulated only with emotion, with desire, and comfort, the result is bondage. The Jews in Egypt did not want to go against the Egyptian government. Remember, we all think of that wonderful time when the Jews left Egypt and they were marching in this long line and they were heading off to the promised land. But I'm here to tell you that it was not that smooth, that Moses did not have that easy of a time. I'm sure that there were those in the crowd and those that were back in Egypt before they escaped and marched out of, of Egypt that were saying, Moses, you know what? This is a little too big of an undertaking for us to do. Why don't we just stay here? You know, we may not have the best life, but we know exactly what's going to happen tonight and tomorrow. And worse than that, I'm sure that there were those who were snitches. I'm sure that there were those who went to the officials and said, do you know what Moses is planning? He's planning for all of us to escape in one night. Of course, the Egyptian Pharaoh said, this is impossible. This is not going to happen. I'm not even going to worry about it. And it wasn't until the Jews escaped and got out into the desert that the Egyptians said, whoa, wait a minute. Something is going on. We're going to lose all of our help. We better go get them. Freedom is being given the grace to choose between right and wrong. And what the Jews were doing in leaving Egypt was the right thing to do in order to experience the promised land. When we allow other people to exploit and to manipulate our lives, we're no longer a free people. We become slaves and in bondage to, to whoever owns us, whoever feeds us, whoever takes care of us. We become dependent upon. I remember after uh, undergraduate work and going to a graduate degree, uh, Remember, and my major was sociology, and, and remembering that uh, there was a paper that we had to do, and I chose to do an interview, and uh, I decided to interview a prostitute. So in the town that I was in, it was not very difficult to find one. And uh, I'm not going to tell you how I know that, but it doesn't have anything to do with me being a participant, all right? But found one that was willing to talk with me. And uh, I said, and part of my paper and research was, why would you choose to become a prostitute? She said, originally I chose it because it was an act of freedom. I could be free. I could be free with my body and do with my body whatever I wanted to do, and I could live life as I chose. So I asked her, have you gained this freedom? She said just the opposite. If I turn a hundred dollar trick, my man that is the guy that takes care of her and sets up her appointments. A hundred dollar trick, 
he gets eighty dollars, she gets twenty. So my next natural response and question to her was, so why don't you leave? Why do you allow yourself to be in bondage like this? And her response was, you tell me how. I have no place to live. I have no education. I have two children. I have no money. And I have an expensive drug habit. Dependency has consequences. Listen to my young friends who are listening. Free at last. Free at last. No homework. No parents. No school. No having to clean your rooms. No baths or showers. You don't have to eat what you don't want to eat. No TV, computer, or phone restrictions. No curfew. You can come and go as you please. You can wear any type of clothing that you want to wear. And you can hang around any friends that you want to hang around. You don't have anything to do. You are free. This lifestyle will last about five years. And then you're trapped. You are now 21. You're an adult. You've moved from home and you discover that the best job you can get is a minimum salary job. At best because no education. You don't have a car. You can't afford one. You can stay up as late as you want, but you don't have a TV to watch and you can't afford to go out anywhere. Yeah, sarcastically, you're free. No, you are in bondage. Wake up. Us older people, all we have to do is look around our own community and look at those 20 to 25 year old young people that had no curfew or perennial guidance. Look and look hard. Let's go to jail and, and listen to the young men and women who are now call themselves victims, according to them. And listen to them say, you know what? The world never gave me a choice. Well, there could be some truth in that. But God gives us a choice. And that choice is to accept him. And yes, there may be some rough roads ahead of us. But as we have chosen to be in communion with him, we will live forever and be resurrected just like Jesus. Well, if you end up in one of these places, you'll have to climb over this sermon to get there. Now look back at this person and observe their attitudes as they scowl at authority. There's a difference between just having a bad attitude toward authority and there's another thing to question and to examine and to learn about authority and then if there's something not right, then question it and go about resolving it in a peaceful way. Statistics tell us that these kind of young people will either be in or out of jail the remainder of their life and be dependent upon society for their welfare. Now I address young ladies and grandmothers and great-grandmothers that can address their grandchildren. Be free with your bodies, young ladies. Given to any young hormone-infested stud. And when you are in line at the 7-Eleven with your two babies counting pennies to purchase a quart of milk or some diapers and don't have enough money. Maybe somebody behind you will feel sorry for you and buy the milk for you. I did. Young men, be free with your body. Have sex with any girl that will let you 
Don't go to school. Ridicule the establishment. Be lazy and spend a lot of time just chilling out with all of your buddies. And one day, my phone will ring. And it will be a collect call from the local correctional facility asking me to come visit them in jail. Both boy and girl will not understand what happened to their life. They had good parents. They even went to church. They had a good home. They did not listen to the call of freedom. And that is to be responsible and accountable for your life. I wish that I could stand behind this pulpit as a pastor for 40 some odd years, longer than that, 45 plus, and say that my life has always been put together perfectly. Everything that I've tried to do was the right thing to do. It wasn't. And I've made a lot of mistakes, and all of us know that saying, boy, if I could just go back and, and do things over again. Well, I probably wouldn't make the same mistakes, but I would make different mistakes. So I believe that I'll just take my life now the way it is and depend upon God's forgiveness and His grace and become accountable not only to society, but to become accountable to God. You see, freedom is not doing what's right. I mean, freedom is not doing what you want, but rather freedom is doing what is right. That's what righteousness is. A definition of being righteous is doing what God would have us do, even when it doesn't feel good, even when there's sacrifice involved. First point this morning is, what about freedom? Learning the truth is just not about information. The Bible says about truth, ye shall know the truth, and it is the truth that shall set you free. Truth of intellectual and spiritual bondage. Learning social behavior. Learning things like history and math and literature. And we talked last week about what some of our young people are able to get college credits for. It would seem to me that we have become a generation just not of young people but of all ages that have become bondi in bondage to the age of information. Now, I'm not against information. I'm not against the Internet. But I'm waiting for better positive results. Most of the young people that are in youth detention center and correctional facilities, crosswinds and any other type of youth detention center are there because they have had free choice and have made their own bad decisions. I once had the opportunity to visit one of these YDCs, youth detention center, and uh, a member of my church was the uh, commander of, of that whole prison. And I said, I'd like to meet you there sometime at your work, and I'd like for you to give me a tour. And, and he did. And uh, this happened to be in Brevard County uh, in Florida. So I showed up at the uh, agreed time, and he began to take me around to the different pods where these young boys are. And uh, I made a comment as, uh, as I was going around and looking at these wayward youth sitting at their desk and laying in their bunks. And uh, I said, you know, maybe it would help if you gave them computers and they might be able to study and maybe learn different things. He said, Pastor, we did that. And you know what they did? They took the motors out of the, fa out of the fan modems where the, where the fan cools off uh, the, uh, the amplifier and the hard drive and they took those motors out and they made a machine whereby they could give you tattoos. So we took the computers away from them 
And now when they use them, they have to be done under the eyes of a guard. So before you scold me and tell me how far I am behind times, I would ask you here and you that are listening, answer me a few questions. How come, as a society, we are not smarter with more information? It would seem to me in my cynical moments that we're stupider than we were 20 years ago or 50 years ago. It seems like that our decisions that we make in everyday life are dumber. And we hear and we read, we've read books on the dumbing down of, of America. How come the art of conversation has been lost? My wife and I joke with each other when we go out to eat, and that's one of the things that we enjoy doing. And, and we've not been married long enough not to talk to each other when we sit down somewhere to, to have supper. So we talk, but in case you're ever in the same restaurant, you need to be aware we might be talking about you. Because we've noticed people that, obviously husband and wife, they are sat, at a booth for two and you know what both of them do immediately is pull out their cell phones and begin I assume to search the internet or their mail or uh, whatever it is they're doing. The art of conversation has been lost. I know people that have the ability of walking up to a complete stranger and within two or three minutes they're able to carry on a conversation and find out about that other person. You know, Jesus had that ability. He had that gift that he could walk up to anybody. He walked up to the woman at the well. Do you know what time that woman at the well was there? She was not there in the daytime when all the women in the community went there to get their water. She was down there just like my earlier example. She was there to meet a man. And Jesus was there. And he struck up a conversation with her. Look at every conversion. Look at every time that Jesus led somebody to God the Father. There was always that conversation before. Why is juvenile delinquency at an all-time high? Why are we out of room in our jails, but yet we have empty pews? Why do drug dealers have wads and rolls of money and the church is always being accused of begging for money? Why does our school system have hundreds of students that are in alternate programs other than a normal classroom? Because they cannot function in a classroom setting. Why is the drug locker at elementary and middle school and even high schools, why is that locked cabinet bigger than the section on religion in their libraries? Why can literature about abortion, birth control, and safe sex be distributed among our young children but yet a Gideon Bible is considered contraband. Well, don't worry about your children not getting a Bible and being able to read it. When you go to prison, one of the first things they give you is a Bible. Why is it always somebody else's fault when we get into trouble? The Christian, on a positive note, has always been, as we talked about last week and the week before that, the Christian church has always been at the forefront of good liberal education. That is, the arts and the sciences. We listen to the New Age educators who tell us that religion should have no part of our educational system. And boy, how's that working out for us? We are being dumbed down. No Ten Commandments, but we can study Karl Marx. We can study Lenin. But true freedom comes from objective research and study. 
Harvard, as we've been talking about, and Duke, and Emory, and Drew, Notre Dame, Oxford, all of our Ivy League schools started off with one purpose, and that was to give religious training to our young people. And then they began to expand and began to include, as they should have, math and science and literature of the great writers. But then they went too far. And now they begin to teach that it's okay to be transgender. It's okay to be a homosexual. It's okay to be in the second or third grade and be talked to by one of your teachers if maybe you don't want to be a boy. Maybe you'd like to be a little girl. Or if you're a little girl, maybe you'd like to be a little boy. And in some places, they are beginning to talk about having you go through that change without your parents' consent. True Christianity does not impede knowledge or education, but rather it encourages it. Some of what we know that our young people are learning today is not education, but it's depravity and it's sin. Secondly, we should be able to experience freedom of discipline to structure life in a way that will make us contributors. To set a course of action in our physical and in our spiritual life. And then do whatever it takes to follow our goals and our visions. As Christians, just because we accept Christ and come into the saving grace of our Lord does not mean that we stop having goals and envision. In the last couple of years, I have found myself thinking some real negative thoughts. I, I've thought about some things that I would like to see our church do. But then the devil slips in and says, Rick, you're too old to do that. If you'd have done that when you were 25 or 30 or 40 or maybe even 55 or 60, you could have done that. But you're 75 years of age. You can't do that anymore. And then I go back to my Bible. And it says Moses was close to 100 when he led the Egyptians out of Egypt. So that tells me I got, uh, what, 25 more years. <laughs> do not demand fairness out of life. Life is not fair. Do not demand equality or even equity, but fight and have principles to make that happen. Don't even demand justice, but simply a chance to learn, to work, and to contribute to society. And as Christians to the body of Christ. And with this attitude, you will always be free. Finally, there is the freedom to choose. The secret of freedom, and I quote uh, a man by the name of Max Millian uh, Robers, Robers Pierre, and he says, the secret of freedom lies in educating people. The secret of tyranny is keeping them ignorant. If we are under grace, we are free to live as we want. Paul says, no. As a part of the body of Christ now, as a disciple, as one who has died with Christ on the cross, our choice must be to do what Jesus would have us do. Our behavior and the way we act reflects our priority on what we admire most. I was in the grocery store a couple of weeks ago and a lady was ahead of me 
and I don't know how I get behind these people, but uh, she had coupons upon coupons. And then not only that, but as they began to ring up her bill from each item that would go over the scanner, she would turn her head around. And, and people that had five baskets ahead of me on another aisle were out of the grocery store, probably home and had their groceries put up before I got through the line. And finally, you know, I said to myself, didn't it dawn on her that when she came to the grocery store, she was going to have to pay at some point, and she did not have to rummage around this pocketbook that was this big. It looked like she could have spent two weeks on vacation at a resort with what she carried in that pocketbook. She finally found her wallet. She pulled it out and she opened it up. And you know that little part of your wallet that has that plastic where you can put a picture in it? And there was Elvis Presley. <laughs> we are free to choose whose picture we follow and whose picture we become. Will it be rebellion toward God, parents, and church? You know, there are other ways of rebelling besides just being bad people. I, I rebelled in my life. I was called into the ministry at a very early age. But I rebelled and I rebelled through apathy. And I rebelled through indifference. And I re rebelled through procrastination. And that is as much rebellion as openly going against something. Will we rebel? Will we, as a, as a nation, as a country, will we continue to re, re, uh, rebel against God's will in our lives, in our nation, in the decisions that we make? I don't care what party you belong to, and this is not a political statement, but sometimes when you see what our country is doing, don't you just say, that's got to be the stupidest thing I've ever heard of. Why are we doing that? My challenge today is not to waste your God-given freedom. Worship, learn, disciple, and make good choices for your eternal life. And the result will be happiness joy and fulfillment in the here and now and in eternity. And that is the way that we gain freedom. Not as was suggested to the Apostle Paul, now that we have gained freedom, now that we have gained uh, uh, being able to not die, now can we do anything we want because we have grace? No. Thank God we now have the freedom of choosing Him and gaining eternal freedom. Now we're going to uh, celebrate uh, the act of communion. The only requirement is that we believe in Christ and believe that Jesus died for our sins. Do not have to be a member of our church, but simply a believer. Now listen to this prayer of consecration. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there by the one offering of himself a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to, con to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee and grant that we, receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Savior, Jesus Christ, and his holy institution. Do this in remembrance 
of his passion, death, and resurrection, and that we may be partakers of the divine nature through him. Who in the same night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. And this day we remember on our nation's day of celebrating freedom that there's even a bigger celebration of freedom and that is through our Lord and our Savior that one day we too will be resurrected into an eternal life in heaven. You can choose to come to the altar or we will serve you in your pews. This is the body of Christ as we break and as we eat. Take this now, the body of Christ, break and eat. Take this, a symbol of his blood, and drink. And as we eat and drink, let us do this in remembrance of the wonderful freedom we experience in our country. But more important, the wonderful freedom that we gain in knowing Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. May the road rise to meet you, may the wind blow at your back, may the sun shine warmly on your face, may the rain fall softly on your field, and until we meet again. again. May God hold you in the palm of His hand. Come back here personally in our little church or online as you have been watching and worshiping with us. Uh, we pray that you will continue to have a uh, happy and a uh, uh, good 4th of July weekend and may God bless you. 
And now as Almighty God sits at the throne of heaven through the grace of his Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, be with us now and forevermore. Amen.